So these are a, a few. Uh, the debates uh, on travel restrictions and, and in really intense, very big impact. As early as in February, W advised against uh, the application, even in countries where in practice, we saw the opposite. In practice, many countries have uh, in bans, options. You can find a, a long list of travel bans and examples of such Wikipedia, the best tools that you can imagine. But we see there that country by country, there are many, many regulations, many restrictions. Uh, this affects international migration. I'm a migrant. Clearly, we saw that migration increased. IOM said that labor migration has been temporarily suspended in many countries, and the visa processing time as well as the assistance provided to asylum seekers slowed down by the past. All these measures have increased vulnerability. The UN has estimated the drop in uh, international migration in 2020. These are purely estimates, but they, they showed that compared to normalcy, the variation in the stock of migrants worldwide, net inflow of migrants, if you want, has decreased by about 2 million, which means minus 27% compared. Um, this is for global migration. If you focus on migration from developing to developed countries, it's even stronger. About a, a drop in migration from south to north, which is around 35 to 40. So migration has been. Uh, the questions we, we, we may wonder when, when we see these numbers are, oh, is it only due to travel bans? Travel restrictions, or can it be due to the fact that people have lower incentives to move? Demand for labor in rich countries, or they just fear traveling? And it's a relevant question because many studies on internal movement within country movement show that the fear of traveling is one of the most predictive determinants. And the second question is um, all, all these travel bans. Uh, were supposed to limit the propagation and the virus, were they effective? Is it really effective to put limit the spread of the virus and stabilize or flatten the infection? The big problem we have with migration is that we have estimates of annual data, but we do not have high frequency. Those high frequency data that connect with the high frequency early data. People, the deaths, the top. So it's very difficult to find sanitary and biological data with migration. But we'll see what we can learn from a broader concept of, of cross border mobility, which includes commuting flows. So turning to the fact, turning to the fact, what, what we have to, to understand is that migration is not the elephant. When we speak about cross-border mobility, uh, and you count uh, the number of movement or number of people who are crossing the border within a year, clearly migration is a phenomenon and large share of cross-border mobility. But if you count or if you evaluate cross-border mobility in terms of not deep border crossing, the number of times that you border, migration is too much. So I just just collected data from Eurostat here to compare uh, the daily flow that in Europe, daily flow passengers and migration flow today in Europe. The first column is coming from Eurostat Labor for Surveys, and it's that on average, uh, every day, there are about 2 million people crossing one border. When you look at air passengers by, by the airport of arrival, you get something which is 2.7 million. There might be another estimation there. 
users can be, uh, can be counted, it's difficult to commit the user safety on train or train below the channel, but uh, from, from Amsterdam, or you need to take a train. So, of course, there is an overestimation there, and it's not clear that people are not counted twice. Sometimes they go to an airport and they take a train. If it's scheduled from the beginning, you are only counted the basis of the last airport of arrival, but it's not always the case. So there is clearly an, ex an exaggeration there. You might have also holiday makers, but saying that you have two million commuters a day and two million air passengers a day, which are there for business reason, it, it is not far from the reality. And on the third column, if you divide the annual flow of migrants by the number of days with a year, you get something. So the big chunk of cross-border mobility commuters and business. You multiply it by the number of day, the, the daily flow of migrants, and you get something like two million as well. So this is what I said, that in terms of number of people involved within a year, migration is important. In terms of number of border crossings. And obviously, one slide uh, before, uh, obviously, uh, when, when you talk about COVID and cross-border mobility, if you think that cross-border mobility could react to changes in sanitary policies, react to infection rates, you should look at the number of border crossings per day. If you think that cross-border mobility could propagate to spread the, vir the virus across countries, you should also look at the number of times that people are crossing the border. So that's why most of what I'm going to say today is connected to commuting flows and to business uh, travel flows much more than internet. And the questions I'm going to, to address are the following. The first one is, how have cross-border flows changed the COVID crisis and why? Is it due to the fear of traveling, to travel bans, to a reduction in economic See if we can find it. The second question is, what role has cross-border mobility played in spreading the virus to people? And the, the last question, as I said, is how can we manage the COVID crisis in an economic cross border potential to And we'll see if the tentative lessons that we can draw from these three studies could also help us to rethink the, the policies towards migration mobility, international migration. So let me first address the third question. What is the cross-border mobility response to COVID-19 in Europe? The starting point of our paper, which is there, which is still uh, submitted somewhere, but we are still waiting for decision. The starting point is that there is quite a few papers looking at how internal mobility, within country mobility, has been impacted by, by the COVID. Uh, you have a couple of studies on Europe, and especially a study by Antonio Spilimbergo from the IMF, which collected data from Italy, Portugal, and Spain. And you have many studies on US counties, uh, areas, or states being like this. And all these studies are using big data, and in more particularly um, core detailed score provided by the telecommunication company, Vodafone. So they trace the, the cell phone owners country, they look at the movements, the movements to, uh, to the workplaces, to schools, to recreation parks, to the supermarket, and so on, and they look at the intensity of these movements. They have movements almost in real time, but they connect that with uh, daily data on um, rates, so the number of cases of death per people, and the policy measures. And one of the main conclusions is that, of course, if you have a stay-at-home requirement, people will have to stay at home. But in general, it seems from these studies, it's a consensus conclusion, let's say, that the decline is mostly associated with the When in the infection curve increases, even if there is no travel ban, even if there is no stay-at-home requirement, people less. So the fear of infection seems to be an important thing. About cross-border mobility, we know nothing. There is really scant evidence because we do not have data on a high frequency basis to connect with these sanitary measures in order of definition and the epidemic. 
came across uh, an interesting database, which is provided by Facebook. In fact, Facebook provided this database at the very beginning of crisis, and you can access this database for free. First, you have to put your password, and that's for free. <clears throat> so we collected, collected data on Facebook users' mobility, and the data are documenting the daily evolution of cross-border movement during the pandemic. We start in the last week of February and we go to the last So we cover a bit more than one year. Um, to be recorded as a mover, you need to have used Facebook in one country, okay, activate your connection and so on, and then activate your connections and use fa Facebook in another country within the same day. And sometimes there are two measures for this. So you can be recorded as a commuter in the morning and a commuter in the evening, which means that there is a lot of double counting. So you might you might say, okay, but Facebook is not perfect. Uh, the first thing is that we saw in the data that they put a threshold, 1,000 threshold below which they do not report the number of people crossing the border. Uh, so we have to account with this, and we focused in our study on 44, 45 pairs of European countries, usually contiguous countries, for which the sensor observations account for percent of the people. But you have many zeros in some, in, in some corridors. Just excluded this case. And the second thing you could say is, is that, of course, Facebook data are not representative of it. And we have no, no possibility to check Check that. Check that you have the same proportion of educated, non-educated, young, old people, the region of origin, and so on. We, we cannot really see if it's representative. The only thing we can do is to check, and we did it, that the, the number of Facebook users is proportional, almost proportional to the population of the region of origin, the next two level in Europe. But more than this, we also check that uh, in the pre-COVID period, the number of movers that are identified by, by Facebook is strongly co correlated with the numbers I showed you. So the sum of commuting flows, business travels, which is a bit reassuring. So we use this data, we compute it to the seven-day rolling average um, for each day. So we take day T and, and take the average of day T minus three to day T minus three. Uh, and we compute the relative variation in these uh, movements uh, captured by Facebook, relative deviation from the, the pre-COVID periods, let's say the, the last week of February. We work in relative deviation because we want to avoid overfitting in our estimation the big corridors. When you express everything in relative terms, each corridor has the same weight. So on the left, you have my, my demonstration, if you want, that uh, the, the Facebook data on cross-border mobility are quite correlated with, with the numbers I showed you in the pre-COVID period. Some of commuting flows, um, passengers, and, and, and you clearly see on the vertical axis that there is this thread out of 1,000, that there is no observation below 1,000. But clearly, there is a, a very strong correlation. It's more noisy for small corridors, clearly. But for these small corridors, a lot of observations after the COVID crisis will be below 1,000, so we, we do not use these corridors. But for the corridors with more people moving, the correlation is quite, is quite good. You also see that sometimes you have more Facebook users crossing the border than in the official statistics, but I will come back to that. It's because Facebook double counts, in fact, the number of people. Who are moving, I will explain this. On the right, you have the aggregate evolution. Over the 45 corridors that we have selected, the aggregate evolution of the traffic in deviation from, say, the last week of February 2020. And so you clearly see here that uh, during the first lockdown, the, the number of border crossings has decreased by 80%, which is really enormous. There, there was no activity uh, almost anywhere. I mean, in Europe. And then after the, the, the lockdown, you have this deconfinement period, which is restarting, and we go back to 90% of the pre-COVID level. 
It's hard to say if it's back to normal because this period is the summer, in fact, August and July. So in August and July, of course, you have many more holiday makers living for vacation, but you have less commuters going every day to... Uh, and then you see the second wave, and in the second wave, uh, you have a couple of jumps during the Christmas, the, the Christmas break, but in the second wave, uh, the, the intensity of cross-border mobility um, goes to almost... Of course, we would like to have a lot of heterogeneity in these, uh, in these evolutions if we want to in identify something. Clearly, if you look at some cor corridors in particular, corridors that are of particular interest for us at least, you see that it look, in Luxembourg, which is the, the left top panel, you have the same drop, 80%, minus 80% in the first lockdown, but then it goes back to minus 20% and becomes very stable. Whatever the partner, Germany, France, and Belgium. Below, you have Italy. Italy, you have the same drop, which was uh, a bit before uh, Luxembourg, because we, you all know that Italy was one, one, one of the first affected countries in Europe. But then you see that Italy is a very attractive country during the summer, and so you see that in the summer, it goes to uh, about 200% of the frequency. On the, on, on the right, you have Switzerland, and in Switzerland, you have big variations with, with the partners. So you see, for example, that a lot of Italians are going to Switzerland during the, 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 the summer, but you see that for Austria, which is the continuous line, it, it never catches up. So there, there is a lot of heterogeneity there. And just to illustrate that we have this binding constraint in some countries, I also put Serbia. Serbia has connections with Romania, Hungary, Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Bulgaria, and you see that there we hit this 1,000 one threshold a lot of times. So Facebook is reporting a zero and we need to exclude these observations. So for some corridors, uh, we have a lot of missing observations. What do we do? We have this daily evolution, corridor by corridor, focusing on the 45 corridors, and we link that with proxies for infection threats, the daily numbers of cases and, and, and death per thousand of people uh, in, in both countries of origin and destination, and we link that with proxies for the stringency of government policy. We use the database which is called Oxford COVID Government Response Tracker which documents on a daily basis all these changes in sanitary policies and epidemiological conditions. We would like to have a lot of heterogeneity there, and it's the case. We have heterogeneity across countries. I'm not showing you that today, but you have heterogeneities over time. So here on this graph, the, the dark, I'm colorblind, but I think that it's purple or blue below. So the darker it is, the less stringent it is, or the, the lower is the infection rate and, and the death rate. And the, the more yellow it is, uh, the, the, the lighter it is, uh, the more stringent is the, is the. So you, you clearly see in the, in the white frame the first, the first wave. In the first wave, testing and tracing policies, these are the two last lines, were nowhere. So almost no testing policy, no quarantining policy, and so on. You see, first two lines, that the number of COVID cases and death were increasing, but nothing compared to the second wave. Uh, the second wave was much more pronounced. And you see in terms of, of sanitary policies that we, we tested a bit of everything. So everything is yellow, so we tried a bit of everything. Um, workplace closing, school closing, restrictions on gatherings, uh, uh, cancellation of public events, stay-at-home requirements, travel bans, and so on. Then you, after, after June, this is the last, the last two lines, you see that the testing and tracing policies start to be implemented, very good. The, the frame on the right is the second wave. In the second wave, we reach the peak in terms of COVID cases and death, and we, we kept some policies, but not all. So we kept mainly the policies of workplace closing, uh, cancellation of public events, and restrictions on gathering. But something important is that, and this is the, 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 the red frame I put on international travel controls, international travel controls have always remained quite important. They are always red, orange, uh, who would the period. So it, it, has very, it has been a, a very uh, used policy during the, this COVID crisis. 
do we do? We connect the data on cross-border mobility with these uh, indicators of uh, threats of, of moving and sanitary policies, and we use linear regression models, but also machine learning techniques. We use the K uh, nearest neighbor, the gradient boosting method, and the multi-layer perception. Um, I do that with computer scientists. And we, we try to predict as well as possible the evolution of cross-border mobility using these techniques and using the determinants, what, what computer scientists are calling the features, using the features that I presented from the Oxford uh, And once we have estimated these models, we take each feature, each determinant at a time, and we, we do a permutation exercise. So we reshuffle completely the observations. We allocate the number of uh, COVID cases of Spain to uh, the UK, uh, the one of Portugal to Austria, and so on. So we, we do something which is totally random, and we check uh, how the score or the root mean square error, for example, uh, varies, it decreases in general, uh, when we do this, this permutation. And we try to identify with this the most predictive um, uh, features, determinants, and the, the least predictive. The thing about the methodology is that we face, we, we, we face a problem there. Ideally, we would like Facebook to give us the origin and the destination of, of the, migrant, the migrants, the movers. So we would define in relative terms the relative deviation between day T and day zero, which is the pre-COVID level that you have in end of February. And we would like to estimate a model in which this relative deviation is explained by origin characteristics, destination characteristics, dyadic fixed effect, or corridor fixed effect. It's important to know if people move mainly for labor reasons, family reasons, holiday reasons, and so on. The fixed effect capture this, and time fixed effect capture this. Like that in the summer, in the Easter break, and so on, you have some variations everywhere. However, it's not possible to have the origin and, and the destination of people. Uh, as I said, when someone crossed the border in the morning from I to J, in general, the guy crosses the border, crosses the border in the evening from J to I. And so you have this double counting in the in the flow of Facebook. And okay, if we if we compute the MIJ and MJI on, on a daily basis, there are some discrepancies that if you average a bit and take the rolling average, it's almost perfectly symmetric. So we really think that this Facebook data, and I think it's natural uh, given this restriction, are more capturing the traffic between countries than the di directional flows between countries. So we can, of course, uh, estimate the, the relative deviation in traffic and predict that with I and J characteristics, country I and country J characteristics, uh, and the same set of fixed effect. But this is a bit uh, a pity to do that, because, for example, this is something we saw in the data. When Luxembourg is reopening the restaurants before the, the neighboring countries, we saw that le less, fewer Luxembourgish are going to Belgium, to, to France, to Germany, to go to the restaurant. So we see a loss in traffic. But you see more people from Germany, France, and Belgium coming to Luxembourg to, to come to the restaurants. And so you have an increase in traffic. And, and you see nothing on the average traffic, while there is clearly something which is directional there at work that we do not capture. To solve this problem, we, 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 we found a trick. So we, in fact, we, we know in the pre-COVID period the direction of the flow in commuting, in uh, in the flights, we know where people are coming from and where they go. So we computed the weights in the traffic in period zero, in the pre-COVID period. We computed the weight of people coming from I to J and the people coming from J to I. Luxembourg, for example, you have 95% of people coming to Luxembourg from Germany, from France. And so by definition, the growth rate in the traffic is the weighted sum of the two things we do not observe the directional flows between uh, I and J and J and I, weighted by, by these pre-COVID omega at time zero. And that means that if the true function of this mu that we do not observe is Fm that you have above, we can predict, in fact, the relative change in traffic by changing a bit the characteristics uh, of country I and country J. So we are defining capital X 
which is the sum of small xi and small xj, so the, the characteristics of the two countries uh, involved, weighted by the probability that i or j is the origin computed in the pre-COVID period. And we do the same with x capital XD, which is the sum of xi and xd, weighted by the probability that i and j are the destination. If fm, the true function, is linear, estimating this function f that you have below would give you exactly the same coefficient as estimating the, the function fm. With machine learning, we use nonlinear technique, but we can hope that by doing this trick and adding some additional information about the prior, the directional priors, we can have a better trick. What we did, and basically these are the performance of the model. Uh, so we estimated the model on 90% of the sample, and we do uh, a validation on the 10% that we do not use for estimating. Computer science, they say we have a training sample and a testing or validation sample. So we use a, a, train, a, a testing or validation sample of 10%, and we repeat the exercise 10 times. So we randomly select 10% of observation 10 times uh, and, and use that as a validation exercise. When you aggregate all these exercises, you have a validation sample, which is 100% of the full sample. You know, we, look, we look at the mean absolute error and the root mean square error of, of all these, uh, these estimation, doing out some out of sample predictions. Without surprise, machine learning beats the linear model, the linear migration model, because machine learning is much more flexible and allows for nonlinearities, interactions between variables. It's not surprising. And we see that with very few exceptions, in general, the dummies, the, the model with the dummies, so the fixed effects, and the model with the priors is doing a better job. Step, once the model has been estimated, we do this permutation exercise, and we identify the most predictive and least predictive uh, determinants. How do we do that? As I said, we take one feature, we randomly reshuffle completely the observations of that feature, allocating the Spanish level to Austria and so on. And so we see how much of the predictive performance we lose, and we normalize the loss of performance of the most predictive features to 100, and the rest is proportional to 100. And when you look at this, you, you, you see that school closures at origin and destinations are always among the, the most predictive determinants. School closures at origin means that parents have to stay with their kids. They cannot move anywhere. And school closures at destination is a good proxy for, let's say, constraints on activity. 10 out of 12 most predictive features include containment measures affecting economic activity. In the, in the and the proxy for, there is an echo there. And the proxies for infection, internal, international travel bans are always among the least predictive. The critique you could have is that, okay, but all these things are super collinear. So we, we used synthetic features instead of all features together by using a PCA. So we, we extract two components of the PCA. The first one captures the economic activity or the measures affecting economic activity at origin or destination. The second one captures the testing and tracing policy. This is how we interpret the two components. And once again, when you do that with synthetic features, you see that the components capturing economic activity, so the incentive to move for economic reasons, are always the most, the most important, and especially economic activity in the destination country. While the fears, the fears of traveling, the threat to travel, are always the least predictable. First, first conclusion, uh, I will be shorter on the, on, on the next two ones. We see that there is a sharp decline in cross-border mobility during lockdown periods and a very quick recovery as soon as containment measures on economic activity at destination are reduced. Uh, our interpretation is that cross-border flows are dominated by essential flows. People move for economic reasons. This is their source of income. And so when movements are essential, the fear of infection plays probably a small role. And about the, the international travel bans, they have a small role as well, 
they are not good predictors just because they have not been applicable. In general, when you look at the travel bans, in many countries where commuters are a large part of the workforce, the countries have not prevented. Very tentative extrapolation. If you think about migration from south to north, and refugee migration in particular, you might think that south north migration to escape extreme poverty, uh, conflicts, and so on, and refugee uh, migration are essential moves. And they are based not on the activity level in the destination country of deity, but they are based on lifetime discounted gain that you get. So it's very likely that the fear of infection has not been the reason why international migration has decreased. The big difference with commuting is that the travel bans have been applicable for that. And so is it a demand side, supply side phenomenon? The lessons we draw from commuting flows would suggest that it's a demand side phenomenon, not a supply side. The supply is there, but people are poor. Second question. So travel bans have been applicable and, and very effective to limit migration, uh, refugee flows, not commuters, should have we been stricter and prevent commuters to, to, to move? Would have been a, a solution to, to limit the propagation of the virus? This is a question which is especially true or important in a context in which new variants, you know, the virus is mutating, when new variants are appearing, should we limit the, the travel ban, uh, the, 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 the movements and the travels uh, in these periods? And on this, the literature offers very mixed results. So you have plenty of papers on the role of mobility uh, applied to different pandemics or epidemics. Uh, I have a paper myself on the role that migration plays in the HIV uh, pandemic in Africa uh, in the 80s and 90s, and for sure, workers in the mining industry, leaving their village, going to spend one month in a, uh, on, on a mining site, having relations, sexual relations with prostitutes, coming back to their village, this contributed a lot to the spread of HIV at that period. But the propagation mode is totally different. You can avoid having sexual relations if, if you want to protect yourself. While with COVID, if you cross someone in the street or in the supermarket, who is blowing on you some droplets, you cannot uh, avoid that. So the, the propagation is, is totally different. So the mechanism is different, and probably that the sensitivity to mobility is very different. And on, there, you, you, on, on this, you have a couple of studies uh, showing that travel bans have been very effective at the onset of, of the crisis when the Chinese government prevented people to leave Wuhan. Uh, they say that, in fact, it prevented the the virus to, to, to spread over the whole countries. But you have many other papers showing that uh, it's not the case and the effectiveness has, has been very limited. So we, we wanted to revisit that using the data, the, the Facebook data and the data on commuting and, and, and business travels that we collected before. And the big question is what's happening with travel bans when it's impossible to block patient zero? Patient zero, the first uh, Italian who comes back to, to China and, and would trigger the, the, say the, the, the spread of the virus into Italy. So we use a traditional epidemiological model, a classical one, the SIR model, which is the simplest one, but we complicate it a bit. But anyway, we use a simple compartmental model with cross-border mobility to, to, address, to address this question. Why do we use a, a structural model, an epidemiological model? You could use econometrics, but if you use econometrics, you clearly see that there is a negative association between uh, cross-border mobility and the infection, the infection rate. Huh? And that's pretty clear that the causality, the causation does not go in the direction that we would like to explore. So when the number of COVID cases is high, uh, for sure there are more restrictions on economic activity and people move less. Uh, but the causation goes in that direction. And finding an instrument that we could use to, uh, to instrument mobility without directly affecting on a daily basis uh, the, the infection rate, it's almost impossible. So we, uh, we opted for a, a structural approach, an epidemiological approach, and we modified a bit the standard SIR model that you, you might know from the ep epidemiological literature. So this is our model. It, it's, it's a pure SIR in which there is no death, 
In many countries, the, the number of dead people is not negligible, but compared to the population, it's a relatively small proportion. There is no death and there is no reinfection. Once you recover, you cannot be infected a second time. So it's a model that pertains only to the medium run period and short run period, let's say the years 2020 and beginning of 2021. So the stocks are evolving with the flow. Huh? Uh, you, you probably you know this model, but the stock of people who have not yet been infected, susceptible in T plus one, in day T plus one, it's the stock of time T minus the flow of new infection. It's the opposite for the stock of infected. It's the stock of the previous period plus the new infection minus the, the flow of recover. Sort of, it's the same principle. The only thing we do is to let people move between between countries using the pre-COVID mobility flows that we have observed. Muting flows, air passengers, and migration, but you have seen that migration is peanuts. Uh, at, at least the effect on, on the daily movement is peanuts. Okay? So we assume that we are in, let's say, June or end of May. This is day zero. In many countries, the infection curve was very low at that time. But if you believe in what has been estimated by the molecular clock of the alpha and beta variant, this is the time where, where this variant started to develop, even if it has been detected way, way later, in October or in June. So we assume that at day zero, you have this new alpha and beta variant appearing in the UK. Okay? Uh, very pessimistic configuration. Pessimistic because we assume that those who have been infected by the standard strain of the virus can be reinfected by this alpha and beta variant, while probably their probability of infection is lower. And very pessimistic context because we assume, we, we have no data on this, so we assume that the, the mobility rate, the migration rate of people, or the commuting rate, if you prefer, are the same for susceptible infected and recovered people. So we assume that infected people migrate with the same intensity, which is very pessimistic because we know that 50% of them are symptomatic. If you are symptomatic, you, would still, you, you cannot move. Okay, you are sick, so you stay at home. And half of the movers are moving, moving by plane, and you have probably experienced that if you want to move by plane, you need to have a PCR test every day, you know, each time that you take a plane. So it's, it's very pessimistic to assume that. But okay, we took this... Uh, this uh, pessimistic case, and we want to see how cross-border mobility can propagate the, the virus without any sanitary response to, uh, to this uh, spread and propagation. So the, the line below this slide gives you, in fact, the parameters that we use. We assume at day zero, so let's say 1st of June 2020, that 10 people in the UK are infected by the alpha or beta variant. And elsewhere, zero, okay? Nobody is infected by this variant, okay? We assume that the reproduction rate is two. So beta, the transmission rate is 0.2, and the recovery rate is 0.1, which is a quite standard in, in, in the literature, epidemiological literature. And we take the MIJ, so the probability or the proportion of people moving from each country, from the data that I showed you initially, commuting data, air passengers, and migration. Okay? Of course, if there is no mobility, if MIJ is equal to zero, the virus cannot be propagated across countries. You have sealed island, and the virus will be contained in the UK and cannot be propagated if nobody is moving. But using the small proportions of movers that we have in commuting flows, uh, air passengers, and so on, the, vi the, vi the, vi the variants are propagating uh, in, in all countries. And in fact, here you have a projections of this infection curve. You know, the infection curve is you start from zero, then you have a peak in the share of infected people, and then it declines, and you have immunity. Yeah? So here, it's, it's just a projection on a plan of, this, of these curves. So the more red it is, the higher is the infection rate. And the more yellow or, or clear it is, or light it is, the lower is the infection rate. The peak with the same beta, the same transmission rate, I will come back to that in the last part, which is short as well. So the, the, the peak is 
the height of the peak is almost the same everywhere. You see that the timing is almost the same everywhere as well. So in the UK, you have the peak after five months, which is October, November, so it corresponds very well to what we have observed in the second wave. And then in the other countries, <coughs> the peak is attained after six or 6.5 months, six, six months and a half. Okay? So what can we do to, to avoid that? First policy, suppose that all countries in Europe are quarantining the UK. Not totally. They decrease the, the, the flow of people from the UK by 90%. Divide the flow by, by 10. Okay? No, no country is totally impermeable. So there is a minimum of, of mobility. I'd be even stronger in the next simulation. So all countries are quarantining the UK. What's happening uh, after, oh, it's important, after day 30. Day 30, that's one month after the apparition of the, the emergence of this variant. So it's July 1. Be aware that we detected these variants in September, October. So it's very optimistic in that sense. So we start quarantining the UK at day 30. The peak of the infection curve is almost not affected. And the key finding of all the simulations we did with epidemiologists is that the peak of the infection curve is in fact mostly determined, the model is nonlinear, not perfectly determined, but mostly determined by the sanitary measures that you implement in the test. What is changing is the, is the delay, is the timing. So without these uh, constraints, you have the top graph, and with the constraints, with the mobility constraints, you have the bottom graph. And in fact, what you have is that the peak is delayed by 20 to 25 days. It's not negligible. It's not negligible because three weeks, it helps you maybe implementing a better policy in the race against the virus and discovery of the vaccine or refining the vaccine to combat this variant. This, this might be interesting, but this is the only gain. You gain three weeks by cutting a lot of the mobility with the UK. Just as a remark, if one country alone does this, the virus will be propagated through France, Germany, and so on, and it will come to Spain at the end of the day, and you, you will win four days only. So you need really a, a cooperation between countries to gain three weeks. Something even more drastic. Suppose that, well, I think that the virus or the variant is very important, so instead of limiting the mobility with the UK by 90%, we limit mobility by 100%. We shut completely the border. And we do not do that with the UK, but with all the partners. So every country becomes a closed economy. No commuter, no air passenger. The peak is delayed by five to, days more. Five to 10 days more. So we had 20 to 25, now we are at 25 to 30. So you win one month. There are a few exceptions. Uh, in Eastern Europe, is that do not have a lot of mobility with, with uh, the other European countries, but okay, this is the only thing that you win. We did the, the, the exercise more precisely for, for Luxembourg, in which we have, as I said, 50% of work com coming from the neighboring countries. These are the three uh, infection curves. So the blue one is without limiting uh, commuter and air passengers flows. The, the middle one is when you exclude the UK only, so you gain 20 days in Luxembourg. The one is if you shut completely the border, the, 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 the last one, and you win 30 days only. At a huge economic cost, because you lose 50% of the GDP if you do. Okay? Conclusion is, is this one. In the race against the variants, uh, the race between the variants and the vaccine, basically, Reducing cross-border mobility can help implement better sanitary uh, policies and develop uh, refine new vaccines. So it's not something which is negligible. Uh, perhaps that limiting and stopping non-essential move makes sense. However, you need drastic reduction in mobility to have effect, and it has no effect on the height of the infection curve. There's only an effect on the time. So the, the key message is that once patient zero has been there and has transmitted the virus to the country, you can kill mobility, shut your border, but it's too late, basically, 
and the effect that you will have will be relatively limited. You will have much bigger effect if you play with your sanitary policy, local sanitary policies, than just stopping the bomb. And so the last question, you, you stop me whenever you can. Okay, okay perfect. I, I need maybe less than this. And the last question is, okay, in this context, can we really manage uh, the COVID crisis and the economic crisis when you have a lot of cross-border workers? So we developed for the government of Luxembourg, but we finally published this paper in a in an academic journal, and we, we had a couple of policy briefs, that we developed a model in Luxembourg which reconciles, in fact, the economic sphere and the epidemiological sphere. And we did that with epidemiologists, economists, computer scientists. So the, the economy is affecting the epidemiology. The reason is that if you, if you have a rise in employment, you will have more interactions at the workplace. The transmission at the workplace is not the same as at home. So you will have a different transmission mechanism. So the economy affects clearly the epidemiology. And the epidemiology affects the economy because if people are sick or in parental leave or in quarantine, of course, you have less workers to use on the market. So there are really interactions between the two. And we build the model that, that basically reproduce these interactions. So this model was designed to help the, the government make some simulations. I remember that we, we the computer scientists built a flight simulator version of the model. So we had a control panel somewhere and a big screen of nine meters over three meters with plenty of results by sector. And the decision makers were asking us to simulate plenty of things. We could not simulate everything, but uh, anyway, I, I think it was helpful at the end for the government. And here I'm going to focus mostly on, on the topic of this talk, which is what is the role of cross-border workers in, in, this, uh, in this debate. So the, the model is very simple. Eh? You, we have no time to prepare a, a paper for a top five journal when, when, when you have to respond to the government and address you know, a topical issue and, and you need to be super, super fast. So what we did at the beginning of the crisis is, is to say to the government, okay, but you had interactions between sectors the, the simplest model to, to account for these interactions is the input-output model. If a sector is in lockdown, it will affect the rest of the economy. We just changed a bit and extended a bit the input-output model with two things. We make it dynamic. So we assume that the, the intermediate demand at time at week T is affecting the production of another sector in week T plus one. And we reconcile this part of the model with the epidemiological block, which is also a block which is modeled in a, on a weekly basis. It's not very important. The most important thing is that we added supply constraints. In the input-output model, when demand increases, final demand or intermediate demand, all the sectors are responding to the demand by producing more. But in a COVID crisis, you have sectors in lockdown that could not produce more or employ more people. And if a lot of workers are sick in parental leave or in quarantine, you cannot employ them. So you have some supply constraints. It, it was very important to add this part. And this limit a lot the I.O. multiplier. So that's, that's basically the economic block. And then you have the epi epidemiological block in which we, we have been quite precise because we have distinguished between students and, and retirees who are all Luxembourgish, and we can be susceptible, infected, recover, and the infected can be symptomatic or asymptomatic. And depending on the testing policy, uh, you, you can test positively some symptomatic people and exclude them from the labor force. So it was very important to distinguish between symptomatic people who withdraw them, themselves from the labor force and those who are okay if you don't do anything. And for workers, we have 16 types of workers per sector. 15 times it means susceptible, infected, and recovered, et cetera, automatic or symptomatic, coming from Luxembourg, Germany, France, or Belgium in 19 sectors. And the Ministry of Health gave us all the data, so the infection rates, the evolution of the infection rates for all these groups of people. So we were able to estimate a SIR model for all these groups of people. So we have a huge block um, determining the, the evolution of infection. 
people can be infected at the workplace or in school for students or in family, leisure, shopping, and so on, outside the and we have two, two connections with, with the economic block. When employment increases, people spend more time at the workplace and have more interactions there. If the transmission rate at the workplace is bigger than in social life, it affects the transmission. So this is what we call the extensive margin effect. The time that people, that, that people spend on the labor market or outside the labor market. And we have an intensive margin effect if you have more people in, in companies, in, in firms, uh, it's more difficult to respect social distanciation and so on. So the, 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 the transmission rate itself in, at the workplace will increase. It's the same if you relax constraints on social life, transmission rate in social life will increase. That the model after calibration does quite a good job. So it's a structural calibration. There is no estimation here. So we, we uh, assume that there are three levels of the transmission rate per sector or per group when you consider the young and the retiring. We had data on infection rates from February 2020 until October. Here we are in October. Okay? With three parameters per sector, we have 220 points, data points, daily data points per sector, three parameters. Say, the transmission rate before you do anything. No on pharmaceutical intervention, no wearing mask, no hygiene measure, so on, no distanciation. So you have this maximal transmission rate per sector. Then you have the one after this NPI have been implemented, and you have the elasticity of the transmission rate to the number of people who are interacting, which is what we call the intensive. With three parameters, the dotted line is what uh, the model predicts, and the gray line per sector is what we observe. So the cumulated number, number of people who have been infected. And we, we do a, a very good job in most sectors. And if you look at the bottom, for young people, for retirees, so young, old, and for the total of all sectors, we almost perfectly fit with three parameters uh, the uh, curve. We were super happy about that because we know that epidemiologists are proceeding in a very different way. So they have this trajectory of infection. They calibrate the polynomial of degree six, seven, eight. And of course, they have a fit which is super, super nice. But then when we simulate, when they simulate the, the next week or the, the next two weeks, it's almost a flat line. You know, it, it's almost a line, in fact. And they do not take into account the fact that some sanitary measures can, can move and, and can change. So with this, we can do it. Okay. To, the, to the main results that we have. Back to May, we have been quite unpopular in Luxembourg because the infection curve was almost equal to zero in Luxembourg. And we said, be careful with this flight simulator. Be careful uh, to relax constraints on social life by going to a if you bring back all teleworkers and cross-border workers to their workplace, you will have more interactions, in fact. This is not the fact that cross-border workers come back, but you have more interactions at the workplace, and so the transmission rate increases. This is the beta, which increases here. There is a big risk of a rebound. So it's very likely that the situation is fragile and that a second wave is going to come. And I remember some articles or some comments in the whole network saying we want to them, we do not want to hear this type of message. But the, the model was predicting that. We also showed that the economic impact of excluding totally the cross-border worker was super, super strong. You have here that if you exclude teleworkers from abroad, you lose 25% of GDP. And if you exclude all teleworkers, you lose 50%. So we cannot live without the cross-border work. But what is important is the last part on, on the testing policy. We said to the government, okay, you want really to, to reopen social life. You tell us what you want to do. We simulate it. You want to uh, reopen some sectors. And the black curve that you have on the last graph is our prediction of the, of the infection curve. So you will have a second wave without testing and quarantine. 
companies. If you test all the workers on a monthly basis, you can avoid that. And this is the curve, which is the most optimistic one. If you test all workers on a bi-monthly basis, you have the, the red curve, I think it's red, so you cannot escape having a, a rebound. So the, the, the frequency was very important. And if you choose to test Luxembourgish people alone and not the cross-border workers, so you treat people differently, you have the blue curve, so it's stagnant for a, a couple of months, and then you have, in 2021, you have a rebound as well. So the message was, if you do a testing policy, do it very frequently and test everybody. And this is what the government did. So they said, we agree with this, we try. So large scale testing, everybody will be tested. The problem is that in Luxembourg, uh, many policies are voluntary. For example, the, the integration policy of immigrants, they provide courses, civic courses, linguistic courses, nothing is compulsory. It's really a country where they want people to choose what's the best. So they did not impose this testing policy to be respected on a monthly basis. What we saw exposed is that the participation rate was 25%. I received an invitation every month. I went every month. I was tested negative every month. But 25% of people did that, which, which is very similar to testing people every four months. And if you do this, of course, you need to, 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 uh, to have a... It was, it was almost certain that you will have a second, a second wave and a rebound. Then in October, we helped the government preparing the budget. Uh, and, and so we integrated the, the macro model that Statec has. Statec is the Statistical Institute of Luxembourg. Uh, so we mixed their model with our model. We had exactly the same messages. Um, in October, after the relaxation of social life, leisures, sport, and so on, we realized that the transmission rate in the workplace and in social life, social life were very similar, which means that teleworking practices were much less important because the, the transmission rates are very, very, very similar. So moving from social life to uh, or leisure or family to uh, to the workplace did not change that much. But still, we, we still have the same the same result about testing and tracing. It's key to uh, improve the trans the participation rate in the testing policy and to test everybody in the same way cross-border workers and Luxembourgish. They, they continue to do that. And we wanted also to show that if there is a takeoff of the reproduction rate and transmission rate in the neighboring countries, if you implement the same rules for Luxembourgish people, cross-border workers, you can control the epidemic in Luxembourg. We simulated the testing policy applied to cross-border workers and natives. We simulate a multiplication by five in the reproduction rates. Belgium, Germany, and, and France, if you test people correctly at home, in Luxembourg, a new home, then you can escape to have this, this big effect. So it's very similar to what we had in the second part of this presentation. So in fact, the height is slightly above 15,000 instead of 14,000. The timing is, is slightly different, but at the end of the day, no big change on the infection. So the infection curve is really determined by the local sanitary policies that you. That that's the. Closing remarks. Um, in the middle of the crisis, let's say 2020, early 2021, 21, we know that all these uh, travel bans uh, use cross-border mobility with large economic costs. And we know that migration has decreased a lot, so estimated by the UN, with a lot of implications for sending and receiving data. Mostly in sending countries, poor countries, these travel bans, uh, this decline in migration has that trapped population, conflict zone, in impoverty zone, you have a reduced amount of remittances, you have lower uh, return migration flows, so this has increased vulnerability, huge cost. On top of that, what we see in Luxembourg is that inequalities between natives and migrants. Economic inequality is first because migrants have been stigmatized, especially Indian people, Indian variants, discriminated, 
So we have seen that they lost their job first. By the way, we have seen a discrepancy which has increased between migrants and migrants. And also in terms of infection, exposure to infection, migrants are living more in urban location, in crowded house. They have a lower access to care. And so we see that this inequality between the migrants, the non-European non migrants at least, and the natives have increased. And, and in the next months, in the next years, we do not know how the migration policies and travel bans are going to evolve. If we are waiting herd immunity worldwide before reopening the border, we can still wait a lot because we are at this stage at 30% even less of vaccination rate worldwide. So if we wait herd immunity, we are going to close the border for a long period. Okay? And we do not know how this crisis is going to affect the behavior of people when they vote. Uh, will there be a, a, a surge in, in, in populism, a rise in populism, extreme right, and so on, because we think that this crisis is due to globalization? Or, this is what Jean Tirole, the Nobel Prize Jean Tirole said, perhaps today it's an opportunity to realize that there are some challenges at the world level, like climate change, global inequality, and so on, and, and pandemics that must be solved altogether, that we have a big uncertainty about the future of migration policy. So what I want to say is that the type of thing we have done on cross-border workers can be a bit fun. It's pretty clear that there are links between COVID and, and mobility. As far as the causal impact of COVID on mobility is concerned, I think we have a strong result that there is a big difference between essential and non-essential moves. And when you focus on essential moves, and many refugees or people escaping extreme poverty consider the movement as essential for their life, when essential moves are, are concerned, the fear to be infected plays a key role. So this is the travel bans that we are imposing that limits the migration and increase the mobility. And as for the reverse causation link from mobility to COVID-19, uh, obviously, Mobility is the factor that propagates the virus. The mobility of patient zero is what propagates the virus across the globe. But as soon as we cannot detect patient zero, because we have not yet detected the variant or because we do not know that the, the, the disease can be transmitted, uh, as soon as we cannot detect patient zero and prevent him to move, after that, the travel bans are much less effective. Um, which means that instead of putting so many travel bans, we might maybe consider treating migrants in the same way as natives, and that comes out from the study, and it's, I know, a very a set of very tentative conclusions, that if you treat migrants as the natives, you test them appropriately, you, you quarantine them when it's needed, you can have the same height, slight difference in the timing, as uh, you have no, uh, no migration. I think it applies to international migration as well, which is a small fraction of border crossing. So even in terms of intensity, we might, feel, we, might, we might think that the effect of migration would be much lower than the air passengers. Thank you so much for this uh, station. I was not surprised that Luxembourg happens that many places in the world where people from the outside are perfect targets just to blame. <laughs> you can blame you can blame the rest of the world just for anything that is happening to you. This is great. So um, questions from the audience, please. You can raise your hand. We have a microphone so people uh, um, online can can also hear that. Thank you. If possible, I, we ask you please to say your name and uh, an institution where you're coming from and then adjust uh, your question. Thank you, thank you very much for your very interesting uh, presentation. I think it is very nice uh, to see how this works with the cross-border mobility. Um, I have two questions. Uh, one question is, I was a little bit surprised that uh, the economy in Luxembourg was so hard hit by a decrease in cross-border mobility. 
Australian Institute in the Netherlands where I come from. My name is Jauke van Dijk. Uh, the economy was uh, only uh, low affected because a lot of people could indeed work from home, especially uh, high educated people, which I expect to commute to Luxembourg. Other thing is, I think uh, you have a very nice model showing that uh, you can control uh, the spread of the virus quite well, even when allowing uh, commuting. This could also be a very interesting for uh, inland commuting, that uh, some people in the Netherlands will say, okay, we should close certain areas, uh, uh, regions. It was very, very difficult to implement because we don't have support. I think your study shows that it's best enough on this, on yeah, the economic... Yeah. First, this is excellent, and the second one I totally share what you say. I, I see more Luxembourg as a region as the country. It's more a region between France, Germany, and Belgium. So what we find for Luxembourg is something that could apply to any not to region in Europe which is affected by commuting, so I totally agree. Your first question would be something that affects the fact that I was not super clear when I presented uh, when I presented the graph and, and said uh, we might have a big drop in GDP if we exclude cross-border workers, that meant excluding cross-border workers from the labor force employment. And of course, we do not want to do that, and we never did that. Uh, cross-border workers can work from home, and they did that a lot. So uh, clearly, if they work from home, you might think that there could be some productivity changes. But we see that in general, when people work from home, uh, for high-skilled people, the productivity is not that, uh, that uh, marked. It can even be positive in the beginning. Even we saw that at the end, people really wanted to come back to work. The big problem is that a lot of cross-border workers in Luxembourg are not skilled. And for the, the jobs that uh, are, let's say, uh, going to the low-skilled, working from home is, is totally impossible. So there are some sectors in which the work from home has, has saved totally the, the country from, from this. I'm claiming that it's not important and, and we can deal with this, but work from home was possible and there is no risk of losing this part of the production. But for other sectors, like the mining industry, which is not that, that's somebody is declining a lot, um, services to, to people and so on, we rely a lot on, on people coming from France, Germany, and Belgium as well. We have a big polarization, in fact, labor force coming from elsewhere. And for these jobs, it was impossible to work from home. So they kept on coming to Luxembourg, which, again, uh, means that there is an additional issue that I did not really talk about, which is the issue of inequality. Uh, we are not equal in, in our capacity to work from home. Okay, uh, okay. <laughs> great. So thank you very much for the presentation. They were very clear and very interesting. I just have two questions. So first is uh, relating to the master learning skill. So are all the variables uh, contemporaneous? Because usually I mean, believe that uh, the spectrum came later with uh, something like uh, seven days. And the second new study is related to the steer model. Uh, so the model is not a field. Don't consider that. So in this case, uh, some people die, of course, not being infected, and they cannot. How does it change uh, your uh, thing? Um, the first question: machine learning techniques. Yeah. So what what we did is to. Uh, explain in deep daily change mobility daily variable of, of tempo we, we take a rolling average of seven days in fact but we, 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 we have a static model if you want we uh, explain change in mobility at day t which is a rolling average by by the variables measured at day t as well 
But in the paper, we also consider the possibility that there is a lag, for example, in the question about infection by policy, even if they are usually announced, which is also a problem that you could put the lead of the variable instead of the lag. But we consider a dynamic structure, and in fact, the dynamic structure uh, reduced the, the predictive power of the model. So we, I just presented today for the sake of, of time and well, I, I was a bit long, but we presented today the static version of the model, but in the paper, in the appendix, we are considering plenty of alternatives, including with lags. It does not explain better the... The second question was about the SEER. Indeed, in, in many countries, in my country of origin, which is Belgium, the number of deaths was not eligible. So you, you might you might consider a model, a SEER model, in which you have death, or people who have uh, covered could be reinfected. These are the two uh, standard extensions of the SEER that you can find. But in Luxembourg, the number of deaths was so low that uh, we decided simply to, to neglect that. Uh, it have added a couple of complexity, not, not that much, because it's a model that easily, but the number of deaths was so low that we did not really consider. So this is for the third part. That's true that in the second part, in which we have this multi-country SEER model with migration, we could have considered um, those that we take. And uh, this could be, but I, I don't think it would change a lot, the, the qualitative predictions of the model. It would make it a bit closer to the data, uh, and it's a nice suggestion, thank you. Uh, well, I think that qualitatively speaking, the story is the same. Patient zero is there, you transmit the virus, you don't see anything for a month, for two months, for three months, but then it starts exploding, whatever you do in terms of travel bans. And at that stage in which you start imposing travel bans, the number of deaths will be probably very low, so uh, I'm not sure it will change the, the qualitative predict. Sorry? Yeah, I mean, you said you, you have been very pessimistic. So in the very pessimistic case, uh, everybody can be able to. True. Yeah. So it, but make, it can make some differences for some countries, in but, but not for, well, for the qualitative. Uh, I guess that you are right. The but do you agree with me that the number of deaths was highly concentrated in the aged population, in the old population? These are not the guys who are traveling lot, uh, even if you many countries in the world going to Spain to spend the summer or even buying a, an apartment in Spain, it exists. So I'm not saying that all the people are not traveling, but this is not the main type of traveler that we, we have in mind in our model. So again, I, I think that it would probably improve the calibration of the model. And I'm sure, I, I'm, well, I bet that uh, it would change the quality. Thank you. I think we have a last question because then we have to move to coffee. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I, my question is close to the question and is related to the first question and the comment of those. How you can workers uh, work from home with partially question mentioned and any laws cannot work. But for the workers that can work from home, they do not see, but they still force the workers to again commit out this paper. They are well treated now, because in fact you have the sanitary conditions on both sides of the board. If you have stay at home requirement for so this is well and we use in fact the, the, the change in mobility uh, which absorb the teleworkers so in our dependent variables we have the teleworkers we do not work with the pre-covid uh, commute number of commuters or business travelers we really look at the, the shape of, of the curve and we account for the variation in the number of people who are traveling and one of the response that you might have to uh, to uh, sanitary conditions or the 
expect is to decide to work from work from home. So this is part of the story. If you want. It's just that we do not split the mechanism. We have the possibility to split the mechanism to identify someone who used to commute before and now is not commuting anymore. We have aggregate numbers into this Facebook database. But clearly, one mechanism through which you can decide not to move anymore is to decide to work from home. And it's part of the story. So I think we, we take that into account. Okay, and any, any question from the online audience? Okay, so thank you so much, everyone. Let's have a break and uh, have a coffee. Thank you. Thank you.